be the case, sorry. Right, anyway, so hi, yeah, thanks for coming. I'm going to talk to you about observability, basically, and why Ubuntu should have more of it, why it's a problem, and why you might need to have it. Um, so, firstly, a little bit about me. So, um, that's me, there. I um, work for Grafana Labs, and I've worked there since last September. I'm on a squad called the Cloud Release Squad. Now, we, Cloud Release Squad is a squad which makes... Um, what we call our internal development platform. So it's like CI and CD tooling for the other squads in the company to kind of um, kind of deploy their, their stuff onto. So if you need to release a product into Grafana Cloud, you'll be using our stack to kind of manage your, um, your rollout and we'll be helping you to kind of make sure that you basically don't break all of the customers that we have because then we get in trouble. Um, yeah. But the reason I'm here at the summit is basically because for a long time, kind of nearly 10 years, I was at Canonical on the desktop team. Um, one of my first projects that I... I'll just wait until they finish with the door. That I remember doing was, um, I think it was back in 2012, I got assigned this task to um, move all of the configuration for all the different fonts that we had for all different languages. They were kind of centralized in one place. XML-based configuration. And uh, I had to kind of move the XML stuff all back out to the individual packages. It was kind of like a crazy project that I had back then. And then one of the last things that I did not too long before I left was um, maybe if you're running the Ubuntu desktop, you'll be running this work now, was uh, moving our desktop from being based on like a GNOME session for activating all of the components of the desktop to like everything being activated by system D. So if you look at like a process tree of an Ubuntu session now, you'll see that everything's stacked by system D units. So like lots of really cool and interesting projects that I did on the desktop team over those nine years. I'm kind of, yeah, obviously close to the community now, which is why I'm still here and kind of in many ways sad to not be, not be on that team. But I'm also still on all of these teams here. So I'm still a Debian developer, I'm still a core developer, I'm still an archive admin. Still on the release team, still in the GNOME Foundation, which are basically all things that I did when I was working for Canonical back then. Um, not been super active since I left, and I'm kind of hoping that, well, the team doesn't decide to kick me out, ever. <laughs> I still, still love them very much. Um, but I'm going to tell you today, basically, what what observability is. We don't have so much time really, so I'm gonna, it's gonna be kind of like an entry, like an intro to the topic. What observability even is, um, why Ubuntu as a project should care about that. I mean, we're mainly in the business of monitoring big cloud deployments, but some of the concepts also apply to the kind of things that we work on in Ubuntu. And then I'm gonna show you the little example. Really, it's kind of like a toy example that I've come up with for this talk. Um, called Prometheus Launchpad Exporter, and like some of the things that we could do, you know, if we were to spend a bit more time as a project on observability, some of the problems that we could solve. Um, but first, observability. Now I'm going to read this one so I don't get it wrong. Uh, it's the business that we're in, in Grafana Labs. Uh, it's about providing open source products to help people and companies monitor what's going on with their software systems when they've got them deployed. Um, and the question is basically, how can we know what our systems are doing when they're running? So if you ever run a system from a, uh, run a, a script from cron on a system, or from a system D unit on a timer, or just running on a random box, it can often be very difficult to know when that system um, stops working, breaks, doesn't perform as well as it should. You know, maybe if you were, had a bit of foresight ahead of time, you'd have set up cron to email you, perhaps if a job fails, but you know, that doesn't work if the job gets stuck forever, for example. Um, and that's the question that observability is trying to help with. You know, when, when we deploy these systems, how can we kind of you know, know on an ongoing basis whether they're still working, whether they're still doing the job that we set them up to do? Um, more often, you know, in the kind of systems that we, we often have still deployed in Ubuntu, it's, Somebody will just notice that a job is not working anymore. You know, they'll come to us and say, oh my God, I uh, noticed that component mismatches hasn't updated for three days, right? That happens on Ubuntu release all the time, doesn't it? Those of us that watch that channel know. <laughs> or like Britney stopped working and we, you know, we, somebody like Locutus of Borg will come and say, you know that Britney hasn't run for two days. And we'll be like, oh crap, because we don't really have good observability of these systems, right? We just have no idea when they break until somebody tells us. 
and I'm here to kind of show that we can do a little bit better than that, really, um, using some of the techniques that I've sort of learned about by changing jobs and working at a company whose business is in observability, realizing that, you know, when I was at Canonical, I could have known this stuff and we could have done it a little bit better. Okay, so the way that we do this basically is get, either getting our systems to tell us, so if we're developing a system, we can actually instrument those systems directly. We can have them talk about their own health continually, things like error rates, the time that requests are taking to be served, the kind of um, sizes of queues, whether things are up or down. These are all kind of metrics. If you think about your own projects that you work on in Ubuntu, those are the metrics that maybe you can think about things that the system knows about itself. Those systems can start to expose those metrics and then we can make those available to our observability platform. Um, spy on them is kind of a reference to what I'm going to do with the large pet exporter later. Sometimes we don't entirely control the systems that we're using. For example, we don't control Launchpad in the Ubuntu project. We're kind of like a consumer of Launchpads. So we, we can write things called exporters, which are kind of like, let's look at the health of an external system. Let's maybe query its API, get it to tell us the size of its queues or whether it's up or down or whatever. And then we can kind of um, report on the status of an external system. That's spying, that's spying on them. So, right. We'll do a quick kind of overview of um, the different types of observability data that you can collect, that we provide um, open source projects for kind of people who are running deployments to, to gather and report back to their observability platform. So the first one is metrics. Now I need to read this one again because I wrote, I wrote a technical definition down. Um, these first three that I'm going to show you are sometimes called the three pillars of observability. And that's because they're kind of like the most, most understood, kind of the, they've been around the longest in the kind of the, the community. Um, so that's metrics, logs, and traces, which I'll show you in turn. They're called the three pillars. And then there's some other new ones which people are kind of starting to think about, and maybe they'll, they'll become more important over time once we understand how to use them better. So the first one's metrics. Uh, metrics are, here's me reading it, quantifiable measurements that reflect the health and performance of your infrastructure. So in this case, the infrastructure is... This is something that I set up, um, how much energy I'm using over time at home. So I can see, you know, have a look at, look at what I'm consuming and see whether anything's changed or not. And you can, you can see kind of, kind of a pattern on the orange line here. This is where I get up and have a shower every morning and use the gas-fired boiler. So if you had access to this data, you could actually probably uh, do a bit of intelligence on my activities and maybe figure out a good time to break into the house. Or if this one goes down, like there, I was probably out of the house for a bit at that point. Um, so I've basically written a little program to query the, the API of my energy provider, look at the data that it's given me, like the consumption in half an hour increments. And on, in this case, I've fed that into an InfluxDB database. And um, we're able to query that back from, from this Grafana instance here, running, running in Grafana Cloud, our SaaS offering, and, um, and render it into a nice looking dashboard. So yeah, in this case, I'm using Influx, but there's many other kind of metrics systems available. Um, the, mo the most native one for ours, us in Grafana is, is called Prometheus, and that's what I'll be showing you later in, in the Launchpad Exporter. The next type of observability data is logs. So let's say a really common thing that we will use observability for is, you know, when a problem happens in your system, your metrics, so your graph here, will maybe it will start showing a spike like here, like you might say, oh, what happened when that spike you know, when that spike appeared, what was the system actually doing at that time? Just having the graph there doesn't really help you. It just says something went up. Maybe the error rate went up, right? Then the next question you need to know is why on earth did the error rate go up? And, you know, the, the first thing you probably want to look into are the logs of the system that you're monitoring, right? Like, what are the logs telling me about what the system was doing when that spike happened? So this uh, log system that we've got is called Loki. Um, essentially, you deploy a collection agent in your cluster it scrapes maybe the, the systemd journal or in Kubernetes, it can look at the logs of all the pods and it will just kind of send those off to a remote, remote collection system called Loki here. Um, and then you can parse and query and filter on those logs. So here, you probably can't read that, but here I just queried a particular application. That's what the top line is saying. Look at this application, parse those logs and then show me all of the warnings. Um, and if, if you had an incident ongoing, that, that would maybe be something that you tried to do. And you can query kind of multiple gigabytes of logs really 
quickly with this system. Um, indexless system as well, so you don't need to kind of um, massage your logs into any particular format. You just kind of send them off to your system. And then on the right here, I'm showing you that um, you can turn those logs back themselves into metrics. So if you have a system which isn't instrumented, but your logs are kind of parsable, maybe they contain a string that identifies a particular error. In this case, you can't read that, but it says level equals warning um, at the bottom there. Turn those themselves back into metrics series, and then you get like a nice graph of how often those logs appeared over time. So you can see there was a big spike in warnings in this system at this time. And then you go back to the logs themselves on the left here and see what on earth the, the system was doing. So even if you haven't instrumented your system with metrics, if it has logs which can point you to a problem using the, using the observability platform that we have here, you can still get a good level, decent enough level, not as good as if you had metrics directly, but a decent enough level of observability into the system. Right? And the last thing that we have in the three pillars is distributed traces. So not so relevant for our Launchpad exporter, but um, if you have kind of like a modern microservices architecture, maybe it's deployed into Kubernetes, um, a request will enter the system and it might pass through maybe 10, 15 different microservices before it, a response is generated and then sent back out to the client at the end. And distributed tracing lets you follow a request through your system, through multiple microservices, um, looking at kind of where it spent its time before it was returned to a user. So maybe you see a spike in request latency. You look at some of the requests that were going through your system during that time when the spike was happening, and you'll be able to drill down through all of the components to see. So this, this axis is kind of the total time of a request. And then this down here, you can scroll much, much further. I just showed you one screenshot here. You can see where, this, where in your system the request was spending its time across, as I say, across multiple microservices. And another thing you can do if, if you're instrumenting a system is you can have your log messages uh, insert a bit of metadata where they can say which request they were um, tied to. So you can expand the log line in the log browser here. I haven't showed it here, but you could expand one of these log lines on the left if the system was instrumented in that way and jump straight to a trace. So if you see a log line which was logging an error, you'll be able to click and go through to this system and see what, maybe see what was different about the logs that were logging errors. Um, and then hopefully that will point to a, a hotspot in your system and you'll know which components to go down and identify, which maybe even which, even which function calls in the system. You can see these are the function calls here. We're performing slowly. And the last one, um, this is extremely new. This product was only launched, I think, last week. Um, it's continuous profiling. So distributed tracing is tell me the life cycle of one request through my system, which systems did it travel through um, while it was in the process of being served. Um, and continuous pro profiling is look at one application, um, which is here, and tell me um, what some particular metric in that application, how that was behaving over time. So here I've, got, I've just got a CPU graph of this application called Loki, the log application. And you can see over, I think it's over an hour, um, how the, like how the CPU graph looked. And there was a little spike here, so that might be interesting to look into. Maybe, maybe something interesting was happening in the system then. So it's different to looking at individual requests. You're looking at the aggregate performance of the system over time. And then on the bottom is a flame. This is what we, what we call a flame graph, which is uh, where the system was spending its time. So in this case, CPU time. So the total is here. And then you kind of see like the breakdown, the core stacks going down. And you can click on these and kind of zoom in if you see any interesting kind of hotspots there. Help you, help you do with your profiling. This tool is called Grafana Flare. Um, Flare with a PH, don't know why. Flare with a PH. Um, and yeah, open source tool. All of the tools that I've just shown are open source tools. So, I mean, we obviously offer them in Grafana Cloud, SaaS service that you can use for free up to a certain limit and then, and then obviously pay for. But as they're open source tools, you can also deploy them in your own cluster. And I believe that Canonical has a team which is offering charm bundles of lots of these tools. Um, so if you're using Juju, you can, you can presumably con consume Anybody from the observability team here? Yep. I'm not from the observability team, but I do work on Juju. Uh -huh. And the cloud and even our internal systems running Juju do use Grafana yep. for these metrics. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I believe, that, I believe that the team internally is working on providing bundles which anybody can, can consume and deploy to get bundles of all of this software. And then you can kind of, using Juju, um, 
form relations with your workload, right? And then your workload can automatically start to be connected up to these tools. So you don't need, so that's kind of like one way of getting your data into the observability system if you're in the Juju world, right? That's yeah. So Uh -huh. or, I'm sorry, we use Performa to monitor workloads, yep. but we can also use it to monitor Juju itself. Yep. So you, you kind of, prov you can provide dashboards in Juju charms, right? And then when you relate those charms to your Grafana, then those dashboards are kind of automatically populated in there. And that's, how, that's kind of how Juju does it. And we do have a similar way of doing that in, um, in our system as well. You know, we, um, people, a lot of people use Terraform for that, for example. Um, so you can provide, you can kind of do your dashboards as code rather than clicking around in a user interface. Okay, and then, yeah, so, I mean, it's all great, except we still haven't talked about the problem of, you know, I want to be told when my system breaks, right? I don't want to have to go to a Grafana dashboard and notice that a spike has happened or my system's gone down or it's telling me in there that something's gone wrong. So the missing piece of the puzzle is like, how do we bring that information about a problem in the system to you where you are? And that's, that's when alerting comes in. So, I mean, the, in, the, in the Grafana system, we use um, a component called Prometheus Alert Manager, another open source tool which you can just deploy in your cluster. And then there's a user interface inside the Grafana itself where you can define these alerts and where they get sent to as well. So this is a screenshot of the user interface. And this one is just um, one of the standard um, Kubernetes alerts that you get out of the box if you install the Kubernetes integration, um, basically telling you that the Kubernetes kubelet in your cluster is, um, it stopped reporting metrics. So maybe it's gone down or maybe something else has gone wrong in your system. And this is something that you really do want to know straight away because if the kubelet goes down, you're probably um, going to have problems scheduling future workloads. So let's say a node in the cloud is taken down for maintenance, right? You want Kubernetes to redeploy your workloads. And if the cluster's broken, then that's going to be a problem, right? And then you might actually have a user-facing outage. So it's kind of the kind of thing that you might actually want to know. So yeah, what's in this for Ubuntu, right? So... We have a lot of processes and things that we do in the project where status updates go to one or only a very few number of people, right? So you might upload a package which fails to build on a Friday night and go away for the weekend or go on holiday or something. Just be busy on something else. Um, well, Launchpad is only going to send that notification directly to you, the person that uploaded the package, right? Um, and you might end up blocking your teammates or your colleagues um, until, you know, until someone happens to be blocked by it and then they might find out that you have a failure to build that happened some time ago and they just didn't know because they weren't told or a package gets stuck in proposed from migration for whatever reason those emails that we send that actually i did work on with Bukash, um they only go to the uploader right so again you only get told the person that, that actually performed the action may not be the best person to know about it for for, ver for various reasons um or we have image build failures. So like, let's say the Ubuntu desktop image has a problem. One of the packages can't be installed or something, or something breaks in the, in the build infrastructure. Well, that's an opt-in list of people that get those notifications. Um, so the, the CD image building system sends emails, but they, again, they only go to the people that have chosen to receive them because they're kind of noisy a lot of the time. Um, or even there's lots of processes where nobody actually gets told that problems are happening. So like if automatic syncs happen from Debian, nobody is told when, they're, when they fail. You only really find out about that when it starts becoming a problem for something else. Or if you're like, oh, why isn't version X of this package in the release? And then somebody will go and look into it, right? Or if a sync from Debian, an automatic sync gets stuck in Propose, there's nobody to email because no human actually requested that action. So there's, there's, again, there's nobody to tell about that. So nobody knows about it until it becomes a problem for another reason. Or like I mentioned at the start of this talk, if some of these essential reports or processes break, um, a lot of the time nobody is told about them. And I'm, I'm actually responsible for making this proposed migration part a little bit worse. So a previous deployment used to have at least emails when cron jobs failed, and then I moved those all to system D activation. And I don't think that that's been improved since, but when we moved to system D, we lost email notification of like some certain processes stopping working. Um, so uh, we, I started to have to look at these graphs manually myself and so I sort of knew that was a problem even at the time but I never I failed to do anything about it and then I left the company yeah. Brian could tell me if that's changed since then but I believe that's still the case yeah yeah and it's essentially because a lot of we have some of the various 
processes in there to do cleanups, like if instances break in the OpenStack cloud or whatever, just delete them after a certain amount of time. But those can be those can be kind of signals that there's something wrong with the cloud itself. If a lot of those start piling up in quick succession, maybe a cloud region is broken, right? We would want to know about that. But given that I caused the situation to become worse when I moved to System D, like I, I kind of take a bit of responsibility for doing for this. And again, yeah, often we have problems when cloud regions, entire cloud regions, go go down. Um, we don't know. The IS, we you know, is a big part of my job, like pinging the IS team in Canonical and saying. Um, I've noticed that the Boston region has stopped working. Can you look into that, please? And that was really only when I noticed or somebody told me that like the queue was ever growing. It was never going down, right? So we kind of knew, I think, intuitively, that we had poor observability there. But now, now I'm here to say that I've learned that it can be done better in the industry, and it does. And the techniques do exist, you know. So we've kind of, let me just check time, right? We've kind of. Um, created some reports to make our lives easier, given our lack of observability. Um, so we have like a report where you can check for your team's packages and see if there's any problems in proposed, rather than having to scroll through the huge list. And the desktop team has this report that Seb is very responsible for creating, which I think is longer. It was existed even before I joined Canonical. I think this is over 10 years old, this, like the kind of origins of this report. And the team uses it every, basically every week, even maybe even every day, to kind of notice you know, are we behind our upstream? Are we behind Debian on these packages? And you can see at the top there is the CD image out of date. And I think this, even this report, as useful as it is, could be, you know, the information could come to you rather than you having to go to it in some cases. In some cases, you know, it's to be decided what exactly those cases are. So, yeah, that's what I just said. A um, bit of previous work, which is kind of related, very more closely related to all of this is something that I worked on. One of the last projects before I left was um, called the Ubuntu Release KPIs. You might not have heard about it because we didn't promote it very well. But you can go to this URL. It's still live now, and you see, you see graphs like this, right? And this is kind of, let's look at things about the release and, and make metrics out of those. But again, it still has the same problem. It doesn't come to you. You need to go to it. Right, so it, it, it may be this here is pointing to an issue. It's actually not because this, I took this screenshot around when the release opened, but maybe this shape would be pointing to an issue, right? Um, but you, wouldn't, you still wouldn't know. You would have to go to this web page. Maybe you'd have the KPIs bookmarked and you'd refresh them or something. And I think, I think Seb is going to talk about this later in the sprint. I saw a talk on the schedule, so um, I won't go into too much detail about this project, stealing his thunder. Um, but the code for that is all here. You can submit. You know, you can submit collectors there and stuff. It's still an open source project. Right, so not got so much time, so I'll go through this a little bit quickly. But the um, project that I've worked on is kind of like a prototype, really. Is to, it's called the Prometheus Launchpad Exporter. And it's, it could maybe, I don't know how we're going to take this. This is up for discussion. But maybe it could, it could become an input for those release KPIs, something which feeds into those metrics there. But it's essentially something which is continually running against the Launchpad API and using that to generate Prometheus format metrics. And here's the code. And it currently sends those into like a Grafana cloud instance. But again, it could be like an internal you know, Ubuntu project instance that we're running. Um, I actually got told off by Colin Watson on IRC in private because my, this became very quickly the biggest consumer of the Launchpad API. I think he said it was by two orders of magnitude. Because it makes so many API calls. <laughs> Because it's getting, well, I'll show you in a second, but one of the things it's getting is the build status of all of the packages in any package set in Ubuntu. And that involves lots and lots of API calls. And Colin was kind of like, ah, <laughs> it might be a problem if you keep running this forever. So like, there's definitely some optimization work to be done there. And I did give them some feedback on the APIs and how they could help me reduce the number of calls that I have to make. So yeah, here's that. This is um, one of the metrics that exposed number of failed fail build failures in your package set kind of over time. So here we're showing like Luna since it was created. We're tracking the number of build failures per package set in the proposed pocket in Luna. So Kubuntu at the time that I took the screenshot had 16 build failures. So it might be interesting. Maybe you want to know something about whether you start to have lots more build failures in your package set all at once. You know, maybe like a GCC update broke everything. You might want to be told that before having to find that out yourself. Um, and the other one is number of packages in, in the upload queues over time, which the release KPIs do have already, to be fair. Um, and so this is kind of like tracking. This is the series, the Luna series again. Series is frozen when they're open, so it's expected that the, that the queue size increases a lot. But, you know, it, it might be an interesting poke to the release team nearer to the release, right? Hey, the queue's getting big. Can maybe spend some time on that. Um, 
rather than someone like Seb having to go and nag the release team because their packages are not being reviewed. It might be interesting if, they, if the team knows ahead of time. Yeah, that's what I always say. We're going to do this with alerts. So quick, quick alert that I demoed up here, which is, uh, I don't think you can read it, but it's basically saying make an alert when, a stupid example, you would never have it in reality, but when a queue, a particular upload queue, has more than 10 packages in it. Um, and we can see that it's firing for a few series here. And at the top here, you can, you can define variables to say how often that condition should be true for. So for this demo, I just made it true for one minute. But you'd probably say, tell me when the queue has had more than 10 packages for a day or something. So yeah, that's alerts. And then you can hook those alerts up to, to where you are. This is the final piece of the puzzle. So basically, I've, in, I've, I've integrated an existing hook to say, take those alerts to IRC. right? And then on this test channel, we, we start seeing alerts. Um, when the upload queues are bigger. So, you know, obviously to be determined exactly what those alerts would be, but could also bring those to Matamos, Matrix, Telegram, Slack, whatever we choose in future, we would, any, this kind of thing could be done there. So integrations exist for basically everything that you would, the, where you would want to send an alert. So that, this, this is the final piece of the puzzle, right? This is bringing the alerts to you where you already are. So you start to know about problems rather than having to go and check them. So, yep, it's just a start. These are some ideas. Um, Obviously, if we decide to go with this further, we'll want to talk as a project, as teams, about exactly what kind of things we would want to add there. Maybe bigger the scope than just the Launchpad Explorer that I wrote. We, you know, we could collect information from anywhere. It doesn't have to exist in Launchpad. As long as it gets into one central system, then anything that's in there, we can, we can make alerts for. Next steps, feel free to get the code, have a look at it, propose PRs, whatever. I don't care if we have to throw it away. Um, it's just a prototype to kind of demonstrate the concept, you know, if, if, it's not, if it doesn't turn out to be this, because Launchpad tells us that we shouldn't be running it because they hate us and we break their system, then, you know, we'll find another way. Uh, write more exporters, add metrics, track it all, decide what's, what we need to know and when we want to know about it. And then, yeah, somewhere that doesn't cost me money to run it would also be great. So that was when I want to come and talk to Canonical about running it in Broadstack or something, right? We want to figure out how to the community can be involved as well, rather than you just having to be on staff. Um, currently, it's running in an AWS cluster. That's it. Thanks.